Okay. Good morning, everybody. Okay. Um, so today we have a, a big journey to go in these three hours because we'll start with simple things about uh, uh, database reading and writing, so some SQL queries, uh, and we'll end up with uh, some uh, basic ability about handling asynchronous behaviors. Okay. So basically, uh, um, the, the, <coughs> the reason why we are studying uh, database access is that it's one, what I said, for, for one, it's a, it's a useful <laughs> skill, we need to do that, but uh, especially it's uh, one example of an, uh, in, say a library that requires asynchronous programming. Mm -hmm. So we already uh, mentioned uh, uh, last time that we are uh, going to use a very simple database, which is a file-based database. So there's no need to set up a client-server uh, architecture. And this is uh, uh, SQLite. And uh, um, it's a very simple library. SQLite itself is a, is a C library that, of course, has some bindings in all the, uh, all the available languages, basically. And, uh, uh, of course, we see how the JavaScript uh, uh, interface is designed. So, um, imagine that in some way you have a file. Hmm? I called it example.sqlite in this slide, for example, uh, residing on your, on your file system, accessible directly to Node.js in the same folder of the project. So first of all, as in any database, you need to set up a connection for uh, you know, having a reference to the database itself. And basically, this is done just by creating, by the um, um, constructor function. This constructor function is called database. And it's a function property of the SQLite module that we are, we are importing here in the first line. OK, so the, the, the native library SQLite 3. I require, so I import this library, it gives me a reference, and uh, SQLite.database will be the function to open a new connection, say, to the database itself. It's not really a connection because it's a local file, but let's say, let's open the file, let's open the database. And so this DB object will be the object through which uh, all the queries will go. All the interaction with the database will go through this DB object that has been created by the database call. The database call itself is quite, it's a bit strange because it has a first parameter, the name of the file, and the second parameter is a callback function that will be called with an error code. I didn't say it will be called if an error occurs, it would always be called when the uh, database connection is open, and it may contain an error code or not. So basically, this function, in this function, you check whether you had an error, then you maybe interrupt the program or something else. This is a callback because uh, you don't know whether the uh, connection was successful or not until later, because it's opening a file is a, is an asynchronous operation. Okay, but. Let's hope it succeeds uh, if, we, if we don't get the file name wrong. Usually it succeeds, uh, or if we, if we have the permissions to open the file. And we obtain this DB. Uh, in the case where uh, the um, connection creates an error, then DB will be null. Otherwise, it will be, will be a real object. Okay, So we can also test for the value of the DB. And at the end, we can close the connection. OK, this is the easy part. And then what do we do inside the database? Uh, there are several methods that we are going to, three or four methods, basically, that we are going to use. All of them are just uh, needed for sending a query to the database engine and then getting the results back. There are four methods because they depend on the type of query we want to run. The simplest one is the all method. It uh, uh, all means uh, um, let's run a query and give me all the results of this query. Basically, it's a for select type query okay, when you are reading some data. And so what the uh, 
syntax of this uh, uh, all db.all function. It takes uh, two or three parameters. The first parameter is a string containing the query itself to, that we want to run. The last parameter is a callback function okay, that will be called when the function is over, when the query is over. And may be called in two different ways. It has two parameters, one error code, one rows result. Okay. This function will be called with an error code or no error code, depending on whether the, there was some problem or not uh, during the execution of the query. So the first thing you need to do inside this callback here is to check for the error code. If there was an error, then the query failed. If there is no error, so if error is false, null or undefined is false, basically, uh, then you have this second parameter that contains the result. Rows will be an array, and each item of the array will contain an object describing the properties of, of a single row of the result. Okay, so inside these braces here, you will have an array with all the results. Um, Usually, this is an array, so you may want to iterate over this array, possibly if you want maybe to print something, or but we'll, we'll do an example right away. Uh, I still have to describe the second parameter, the second argument to this function. The second argument is optional, maybe they are not. Um, this square brackets uh, tells us that this will be an array argument, so I need to pass an array. And this array will contain the query parameters, the variables they want to inject into the queries. Okay, so if we have a query that contains some parameters, we don't uh, embed the number or the, the values inside the query, but in the query itself, in the string, we put a, a question mark, uh, and here we replace the value for that question mark. Mm -hmm. uh, we, if, if you already did that in other languages, it's, it's the same thing, otherwise we'll get to that into an example. Um, very quickly, other, there are other two uh, methods of the SQLite uh, uh, database object that work exactly in the same way, with the difference that uh, uh, get, instead of all, only returns the first row. So the, it works exactly in the same way. The, the parameter of the callback function is a single row, so a single object, describing one row of the result. And it may be useful if you know that your query all, will always have just one row. Maybe you are doing a count uh, select, and so an, an aggregate function, well, the result is only one row. So in this case, you don't, you, you might call all that will return an array with only one element, uh, and you, you can skip that uh, by get, uh, calling get, and you only get the first result if you want. Or uh, each it combines basically the all, so getting all the results with a functional iterator with a for each of the results. So in this case, it executes exa the exactly same query as we had with the db.all, but instead of returning one array rows, we see the difference here. I call it rows, and it is just a one row. So this callback is not called once with the full array of the results, but instead it's called for each row, for each result. Okay, so this callback will be called many, many times, and every time it will only contain one row. It may be useful if you don't want or you don't need to store. Maybe you expect this result to be large, and so you don't want to retrieve all of them at the same time, and you want to process them one by one. But there are just Variations on the on the topic on the theme of, of the db at all. Theory. There's another the fourth function, which is slightly different. Uh, that is used for all the other queries that are not uh, uh, select queries. So all the queries for modifying, the update, delete, uh, and the insert, basically you know, the, the main uh, uh, SQL verbs. So in this case, we don't have a result set. We don't have some result, some rows of results. And uh, uh, so we, the callback function 
only contains one parameter that will be the error code. And otherwise, if there is no error, then we assume that the operation was successful. So we don't have any result to process, basically. Mm -hmm. um, there are some details here that we, uh, we are not seeing uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, you see that I wrote this function with a function expression instead of a narrow function like we always did. This is because uh, uh, if we write the function in this way, inside the callback, uh, we may have some information, for example, especially this is useful, especially useful if you are doing an insert. So you are inserting something to a table and maybe you have a self-incrementing ID and you want to know which ID was assigned to the element that you just inserted. Okay. And so this can be retrieved with this dot like last ID, but this variable only works uh, if we are in a function expression and not in a narrow expression. This may seem strange. We will understand that when we see uh, when we study the, the, this keyword in, in JavaScript. For the moment, just set this aside. Just remember that there are some strange things behaving uh, in this uh, callback function when we want to access this information. How many rows have been modified? And what is the last uh, ID of the inserted element if we are doing an insert of a single element? Hmm? But these are details. So uh, how can we test it? Uh, so what I did was to create, I use uh, one simple uh, front end. No? There are many small programs that help us uh, working with SQLite. Uh, I didn't want to write uh, create table by hand and so on, or insert data uh, by hand. And so I use this program, which is called SQLite Studio. At least I put the link on Slack this week. So maybe some of you already tried it. And I created one database here that I called uh, transcript.sqlite uh, to hold the transcript of the exams. Inside this database, I created a table that we call exam, but it's just a simple front end. And inside this table, so I have some tabs for uh, defining the type of uh, columns of the table and for inserting some test data for seeing something. Like test data. This is just a, uh, something to, 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 to interactively look at the SQLite files or create and modify them. Okay. Uh, SQLite is tr quite strange, so if some of you were upset by the fact that JavaScript didn't have any strong typing, uh, you may discover that also SQLite doesn't have very strong typing, so you can have a, a, an integer column and you can store a string into that column and SQLite uh, doesn't care and we store it and go forward with that. Okay, so uh, again, it's all in the hand of the, of the programmer. Uh, also here, I, I selected the date column, but actually date is just a string in, uh, in SQLite. So you are basically uh, at a very simple low level of, um, of operation. But anyway, this was just an example uh, uh, for showing that I created one file, uh, transcript.sqlite, and I uploaded that file here in Visual Studio Code. So let's remove this because we are not there yet. And uh, it was already, if you, if you downloaded the, the project, if you updated the project uh, uh, in week three, you, you, are, you find this file, hmm? uh, transcript of SQLite. So we can work uh, with that hmm? instead of creating that from scratch, just to, to make it faster. Uh, there's also an export script uh, with the, you can run this script uh, on to, with SQLite uh, to recreate this database. But anyway, we are just, Exercise in that. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's try, for example, to see from our program the content of, of this file, no? the, no, the names of the courses, whatever, or the scores. Okay. So uh, let, first of all, I had to create or to import the uh, SQLite tree uh, library. So this is the package.json. I already did the npm install SQLite 3. Of course, you need that. And we can start, for example, uh, example, 
That's good. Or JS. Hmm? Right, to see how to, to read the database. So we first need to connect to the database. Uh, let's make it a bit larger. First, we need to connect to the database, and so we uh, require SQLite library, SQLite three, and uh, we open the connection. So DB equal to uh, new. SQLite dot database two parameters one is the name of the file week or three and the path depends on or the current directory where we are starting uh, uh, the, the program right now I since I have many subfolders that say uh, not JS is run on the main folder uh, otherwise if you run it by hand uh, you can get away with the folder because uh, so the basic <laughs> issue the uh, first time is to understand in which folder, in which directory the program is being run in order to write the correct path for the for the for the database file. Okay, I can do it. And the second parameter is the callback function in the case of errors. So if uh, callback function that takes one parameter, the error, and executes in the case, uh, in uh, um, always executes, so not just in the case of error. So I need to worry only if there is some error. And in this case, uh, we can, for example, in the, in the slides, there's a suggestion to throw. Uh, an exception. Sorry, don't remember the syntax. Uh, yeah, just throw the error because error is, is already an exception error, so we can throw it immediately. Otherwise, so this function will be called if the error is not null, is not undefined. Then we throw an exception. We interrupt the program. Otherwise, we can. We can proceed. And we have the reference to the database object. And we can start running a query on this object. So db.all okay, is a method that uh, doesn't return anything, or basically it returns uh, a reference to the database object itself. So it returns DB. So the return value of an asynchronous function is always irrelevant because there is no value to return until the, oper the asynchronous operation is completed. So there's no meaningful uh, result that we can get from the all function. Three parameters. One is the query. Okay, let's maybe define a string instead of writing it online. Const, uh, const SQL may select everything from exam. If I don't remember, exam is the name of the table. Yeah. Of my database, there is also a small extension in, uh, in Visual Studio Code uh, that is called SQLite. Again, I, I, I had the light the, um, the link uh, last week. Uh, so if you take the if you select uh, with the right click uh, the, the name of the database, uh, we have an open database uh, function that creates a new panel here on the left uh, with the name of the files, uh, file or files that are being opened. You can examine them or by clicking on this arrow here, it will open a window 
containing the with the content of the table with the data so we can have a quick uh, a reminder of the name of the names of the columns for example okay so the name of the table is exam and the name of the columns are code names if you date and, and score which is hidden in the right here just core okay so uh, if you just for it's not to, it's not a power, powerful extension you cannot create tables or something like that but just for inspecting the, the current values is uh, is quite useful because you don't have to leave uh, um, the the editor okay so uh, this is a query we can run the query the, as a first parameter and the second parameter we we don't have any uh, arguments in this query and the variable parameters we just have a second argument which is the callback with error and rows and the body of the callback will be called when the query is over okay so here we have code that will execute after the the query is run so we can first of all check if we have any errors then uh, we can throw an exception or we can create an error message or whatever otherwise we are doing the, the, the real work here so we may create maybe the list of the names uh, all of this uh, so let's see let's put the bugger point here so you can stop the execution and have a look uh, at this rows parameter and okay? what does it, what it contains so that then we will write the code uh, to to um, examine that so if i run with f5 this file it doesn't have any errors right uh, for the moment okay let's have a look at the rows object here rows is an array of let's make make it a bit wider uh, rows is an array of uh, 13 elements and these elements are objects so element zero is an object with uh, see a few code date name score um, properties so we create one object per every for every row of the database with the key of the object uh, equal to the column name to the name of the columns of the results of, of the query and of course the value will be the value of the first row second row and so on second element of the rows is another object with the same uh, of course keys and the values corresponding to the second row and so on okay so at this point i stopped the debugger here at this point in code we have this data structure one array of objects which is quite convenient basically hmm, for us to work so we wanted for example to print all the names of the courses okay so to print all the names of the course we just need to create an array of names uh, and then print it so creating an array of names of the execution uh, creating an array of names uh, just means const names uh, uh, equal rows uh, dot map uh, and we extract only the names uh, exam Give me exam.name. And we can print the names, for example. Okay. If I run this, it will print uh, an array with the names uh, extracted from the query. So as long as we know what to do 
with the results, uh, we can do it inside these braces here. In the callback function, if there were no errors. Okay. Uh, and if we want to, but here we are, you know, uh, inside these braces. So how can the result uh, escape from these braces? So imagine I want the results, uh, so this list of names uh, to be available here. Okay. Uh, so it seems easy because we can just uh, define this uh, variable instead of defining it in this context. Uh, they will, of course, kill the variable when the context close, when the block finishes. We define it uh, outside. So we can define it const names here, maybe an empty array as a default value. And then here we don't really declare it, we're just assigning new values to that array so that we can move the usage of this variable here instead of doing that in a nested inside and if inside a callback inside a call function call okay so we have it here very clear outside and so we can proceed with the program except that it doesn't work. Hmm? It doesn't work because if I run this program, uh, sorry, okay. first is a very stupid variable uh, error because it was constant and then trying to modify it uh, here. So I, I have to declare that with the names. So otherwise I may have a push to, to, to populate it, but. So let's have a look at the console here. We have two, two prints, two data printed here. One is the uh, list of 13 names. We already know that. And the other is an empty array. This empty array is the result of this instruction in line 24. So it's empty and it came before the other. Totally messed up. So it was printed before, even if it comes later in the code, and it's empty. Why is that? Well, because line 24 is a synchronous statement that will happen immediately after line 14. In line 14, we have a function call. <coughs> Sorry. They will take very little time, execution time, because it will start an operation on the database that we go on asynchronously. The operation on the database may take, will take some time. But in the meanwhile, <clears throat> the code will run to the next statement. So when line 24 is executed, it will be executed right away after executing this code here. But this, um, when we execute line 14, we are not waiting for the result of the query. We are just starting the query. That will be executed in parallel. And only later on, the query will be finished and we can execute this code. So basically, this block of code nested inside the callback function will be executed after the console.log we have in line 24. So uh, when, whenever we run an asynchronous operation, just remember that the instruction after that don't have any um, way of knowing the results of the query, because they will be um, executed before the query is even completed. Okay, so the code is not executed in the order in which we are seeing it. It will be executed in a different order. Um, and this makes uh, complex uh, to 
to use the results of the query. So if, if, I, if I, can, I can reuse the results right there on the spot, I'm fine. That callback is normal synchronous code that will be executed as a side when the time comes. But I cannot expect uh, the code after the after line 24, basically, to do anything useful with the results of this query. OK, so if our mind think, thinks, uh, I do the query, and then, OK, then means uh, inside here. It doesn't mean after the call. So basically, here, we don't have anything useful to do. We can't do anything useful to do. We cannot even say, OK, let's wait for the query to complete. Hmm? It will complete sooner or later. And then the code will, ex will be executed. So how can we make use of this, inform of this data? So if we have uh, one, if we want to use these values, we have to rely on some asynchronous tricks. So imagine you want to do something with these results, and we, of course, we don't want always to do a console log. We do want to do something. OK, so what we could do is to wrap all this uh, query into a function and call uh, read names, course names, uh, that will execute this code. So I'm wrapping everything here in a function. Uh, okay, you have complaints. I installed a linter to check for my code, but it's really too picky for my tastes. Um, so, in this case, we could uh, call this function that will run the query and have some way for the function to return the result to me so that the, uh, the names array so that they can use the result. So let's forget the, the hope of defining it elsewhere and define it inside, like we did before. We know that it, this works. The only issue is how to extract the values of this names array outside of this function. So you would think that a return names works. Actually, doesn't work because this return statement, oh, sorry, this return statement returns from the callback. It doesn't return for the from the function. So we cannot write uh, console uh, const uh, my names. I change the name of the variables equal to course names, and then print my names. This doesn't work because this return doesn't return a value from course name. We are, we are inside this callback. So the return should be outside the callback. But we already know that we cannot put it here, which is outside the callback, inside the function. It will return a value from the function, yes, but this value will not be ready, available yet, when this return is called. We will have the problem as before. It will return an empty array. So how can we let this value escape from here? We need to think in an asynchronous way. We can have accept a callback. We can receive a parameter, which is a callback, that will do something with the value. So we know that here we have the value. We don't want just to print it on the console. We want to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, with the result. We know that the result is uh, this variable. And so what is result? The result is a function that does something with the result. 
And how these course names know what to do? It doesn't know. It just received the function as a parameter. And at this point, the, the course name functions will not return a value, but will require one parameter, which is a function that we receive the array and can do something with the content of the array. OK, so to process an asynchronous result, we must have an asynchronous way of doing that. So in line 28, we are not processing the result, but we are deciding what to do with the result when it's ready. In a callback that will be called by the function that will ac really execute the query. So we are, in a way, jumping from an asynchronous callback to another asynchronous callback. We are registering a callback to be done. So when the, the query is done, this callback is executed. When this callback is executed here, in this line 21, we are calling the second callback inside the first callback. Does it work? Yes. Of course, uh, my names only lives uh, inside these braces. We cannot use it in line 31 after this function call. OK? And this how uh, the uh, working with asynchronous code is going to be. It's, uh, it has a special name, it's called the callback hell. Huh? Because then we have a callback that will set up another callback whose result will call a third one and so on. So it's very di difficult in our mind to keep track of what is happening and the order in which different stuff uh, is executed. Okay, so we are going to find today some better ways of handling this. So this was the way in which JavaScript is intended to, to be, is it to work since the beginning. And since a lot of people have been struggling okay, with this way of programming, this is a very simple example, just five lines, but we already know that it's very difficult to follow. And we are not, not modifying the database, we are not doing anything fancy. Okay? It all starts with a synchronous code. It doesn't even start with an asynchronous event that comes from the user. So you can imagine it will get exponentially complicated quite quickly if we don't have the control over the, how the different functions are, are called. So the, uh, the, the future work versions of JavaScript uh, have invented uh, a, a better way of handling with this. First, with a concept called promise, which is a new type of object that helps us to handle the life cycle of an asynchronous object. And then with two new keywords that are called async and await uh, that uh, even more simplify the usage of promises. So we are doing, we are following this way. I wanted to give, to give you a taste of what is really happening down there. And in some way, we have some syntax, some help from the uh, library in managing this kind of callbacks here. Because this is the mechanism, the only mechanism that they may work. Having a callback on the right, inserted in the right point, and they will be called at the right time. But this is not a standard here. There's nothing that it all relies on documentation. Okay, so the, the the idea of promises is to standardize this behavior, so to make it easier to use, uh, easier to to cater for the good case and also for the the bad case. So, for example, throw error. Who is going to catch this exception? If we want to terminate the program, that's fine. 
But if you want to manage this exception, the catching of this exception is not because this exception is not thrown by this function. We cannot have a catch here inside course names, around course names, because uh, the execution of this course name function will be long done when the execute when the exception may may be thrown in the future. So this exception actually cannot be cast because there, there's no longer a cont a cont a syntax context where it can be done. So in, uh, unless we have a bigger context, uh, but it, it becomes complex. Okay, so we, we need we need to uh, have a way of not throwing exception here, but maybe having a second callback function that we will only call back when something goes wrong. If you see. This is what, in some way, uh, SQLite is doing. If there is an error, I will, that's all, I will call, in any case, a callback. And in this callback, I give you the information of what happened, whether there was an error or not. So you have to manage that, that error explicitly, because the db of all function could not, inside, throw an exception, because I would have no way of catching it and handling it. It becomes complex for that reason. Um, so bef before seeing the um, the promises and the other, say, more advanced way of dealing with asynchronous code, uh, there was just one, um, this topic about, this more detail about the um, SQLite library, uh, about the second parameter that I described in the, in the query functions. Um, whenever we have a query that may contain some variables, so for example, we want to select the name of a course with a given code. Okay, so the query would be uh, from course where code equal to, and quoting the, the string corresponding to the code name. Uh, of course, we don't want to, we will never want to create queries by concatenating strings. Okay, because that would be uh, opening the door for SQL injection attacks, uh, because we, are, we will be composing into SQL syntax something that may come from the user, may come from outside, and we are uh, concatenating, creating a string that contains some user text, uh, and it's extremely dangerous. Okay, so we always want to create uh, uh, the, 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 the strings that represent our queries will always be static, constant strings in our code. And if we need them to have some variable component, uh, SQLite provides us with the question mark syntax that represents one variable parameter. And the, vari uh, the value of this variable parameter will be given in the second argument. So uh, SQLite, we take whatever code represents now, a number, a string, uh, or anything, and we'll safely inject here into this place. So even if this code tries to, is a string that tries to you know, uh, escape from the query and run some illegal uh, SQL statement, uh, it will not uh, happen because it's not, it will not just, be, you know, the value of code is not just replaced uh, in a string way. Hmm? It's not being concatenated in the place of this uh, question mark. It's being sent separately, so uh, SQLite will process the string, the query, and then take the value of the parameter after the parsing is done. So even if there are some syntax here that looks like a SQL string and try to inject some malicious code, it will not work, okay? so. It's a safe way of ending parameters. If we have only one parameter, this is the syntax. If we have more than one parameter, I will have many question marks. If I have three parameters, I will have three question marks. And so I will have an array of three elements here, each corresponding in order to each of the next question marks that we have. Okay. So it's very easy also to construct uh, queries uh, that contain some va variable values. Uh, Always with this syntax, never with string concatenation with plus, and never with template strings. It may seem 
know, easier at the beginning, but actually you are only looking for trouble. Hmm? Okay. Um, this is just the same examples that we did before. Uh, there's also some bigger trouble. Uh, just to make, uh, uh, I, I know I'm not running this, but uh, there's an example that we can uh, build uh, to show what another danger behavior of synchronous code. Okay, before seeing some solution. Uh, so I imagine I just create a very simple database, one table with one column number. Okay, and uh, okay, this is uh, the starting table. And then I want to do something very silly. Insert a new line, so another <laughs> adding another one. So we'll have a table with many ones. One, 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 one. With many rows and all the same values. The simplest example we think of. And uh, then I want to count how many lines do we have. So count asterisk from numbers. So initially I will insert uh, a one. And the count will give me the, the value one. And then I insert another element, and the count will give me a number two. Then I insert a number, another one, and the value of the count will be three, and so on. Okay? This is what how we think about it. I insert some data, and I process the data that I just inserted, and they look back. So if I try to translate that into code, I could come out with this code here. It's a complete program, so if you want, <laughs> you may paste it, but we can read it. We repeat 100 times two queries, the insert of one and the select of count. And of course, for every execution of this select, we will print Okay, so all could have been uh, just um, uh, the first row. We only have one column called tot, one row. We, we take the, the total column from the first row of the result. And we print it. So we would expect to see an increasing sequence of numbers. One, one, two, two, three, three. Instead, what we see is, okay, I run it several times, not just 100 times, 89, 90, 91, 92, 96, 96, 96. See how it's nice. 92, 96, 96, 96. And then 7, 8, 9, 9 again, 400, 400 again. So this is an actual output for this program. I didn't make it up. You can reproduce it. But we have an insert followed by a select, and then we repeat it with another insert, another select, and so on. So what is really happening here is that, of course, the insert and the select are not being executed in this order. So I'm saying, OK, let's do an insert. And immediately after, I would say, let's do a select. And both of them are a synchronous operation that started right away. And we don't know which completes first. They, the second one doesn't wait for the first to finish. Select when you start and finish before the insert is done and so on. And if we look at, of, at this loop here, it will execute very, very quickly. Because it will, we would only say, Activate 200 queries, and this query we complete out of order. So it is a, this is a very tight loop. This operation db dot one takes no time at all. Db dot all takes no time at all because it doesn't do any real work. It only starts the operation. So this for loop will not take the time of 200 queries. It will take a very little time, micro, micro, one, one, one microsecond or whatever, and then the queries will run. And the, 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 the asynchronous part of JavaScript will have 200 
queries to execute and 200 callbacks to call when this when each of these queries are executed and so we'll take some time to complete all this list of asynchronous operations to do okay but this is something that javascript is good at doing we shouldn't work on that but the result is this so what we imagine that are two blocks that are executed sequentially basically they overlap in an unpredictable way. At the end of the day, of course, the, the total will be 400 or 100, 200, depends on how many times, uh, because all the inserts will be done. Fortunately, because insert is an atomic operation and it doesn't depend on other inserts being done at the same time. But uh, the so the inserts themselves may overlap, the, the, the counts themselves may overlap, and they may overlap with each other. They will overlap with each other. And so when we get the count values, so we take the points here where the selects, the, where the counts complete. And they may happen at random times uh, compared to the inserts. So more or less, JavaScript tries to keep the same order of execution of the function, but the time needed for the database uh, for completing the operation is not always the same. So even with this simple example, we are not able to create a, a, an increasing sequence of values. And basically with this code, okay, what you say is, okay, we, let's apply the method we had before. So we can call the uh, count from inside the callback of the insert. Okay, because when can we start the call, the, the, call um, the count? Here, in this callback here, in, we have an if error, else. If not error, I can start the count. So I will be sure that the count only starts after the insert is done. And vice versa, the next insert, we, I want to start it only after the count is complete. And so I will put the insert inside the callback here after the console.log, I will start the insert. But this is not possible because I cannot have this code in the callback on the other and at the same time the first code in the callback of the second one. It's a, it's a recursive callback, but you cannot have an infinite <laughs> Okay, it cannot be done in this way. We should not think in this way. There should be other ways of thinking, of organizing our code. If we want to force, so let me say it this way, the nature of JavaScript code is to be asynchronous. If we want to force it to behave in a synchronous way, we have to find another way. Uh, it turns out that many times uh, we don't really need the operation to be carried on in a predefined, very specific order. We only need some chains of orders. So this will happen after the other one. Event one will cause event two, that will cause event three. We want to keep uh, this chain of dependencies. And so we can we have event two in the callback of event one and event three in the callback of event two or something like that. And then everything else may happen in the order that we want. So we, we must release the control over the actual order of execution operation when we don't really need it. Yeah. Uh, so how, we, how do we solve this dilemma, this problem? Okay, let's see what the, lang the language has to offer to us. First of all, um, promises. Hmm? Promise is something that tries to avoid the so-called callback hell. So when we have some steps to do in sequence, one after the other, actually there's no sequence in the synchronous way. So uh, we, as we saw, we have to put uh, the next operation inside the callback of, of the first one either syntactically or with a callback function to be passed as a parameter and create these chains of 
nested callbacks that are very hard to follow. And so uh, the designers of the language decided, invented on this feature in the standard library that are called the promises from, uh, uh, let's say, 2016, and they will map uh, uh, nicely with the async keyword that we'll see next. Hmm? Um, what is a promise? If a promise is an object that can be returned by a function calling some asynchronous behavior. So before I, was, I said, um, there's nothing useful that this function can return. There's nothing useful. Because the function itself doesn't have any result right now. Okay? Um, promises are one type of object that we can return from a synchronous function. And we are saying, I don't have any result to provide you now, but I give you an object that sooner or later will have the result. So I return a promise. I don't, I, I can't give you the result right now. I can give you a promise. And this promise will have the result sooner or later, or will have never. So I can have an object that I can pull out from the function and use it, pass around, store it. I cannot use the value of that object until the value is there, because initially there's no value. But at least I have a reference object that I can use and store and pass around. I can move forward with that. I just need to be aware that it will be ready when it wants, not right now. So actually, the promise is an object that represents that some operation will complete in the future. Of course, when it completes, it will have some callback mechanism that to tell me that it completed. But at least I can control, I can manage the callback outside the original call. It's a way to standardize this callback mechanism and also the error handling mechanism. Um, and there is a lot of, uh, of all these say, the more and more, the more recent interfaces, more recent APIs uh, use this promises mechanism. Okay, so we can. It's a normal object in the library. We can make a new promise, and it works. Uh, or in many cases, a lot of libraries already return as promises objects instead of. So we, you see that all the modern API, especially the fetch API that we, we will use to communicate uh, from the client to the server, uses this uh, mechanism. Huh? So it's always a good a good idea to follow this lead. Uh, we use SQLite because the SQLite three interface doesn't use promises yet. So we can see how to build them and how they behave and which problem do we have. Hmm? So basically, a promise is an object. Uh, as we say, that will start, uh, let's say, in a failing state. The promise is just a promise. In the future, it will be fulfilled, or in the future, it will be rejected. So I'm making you a promise right now. I'm returning an object. Right now, in this moment, you, you don't know whether I will fulfill the, this promise or not. In the future, I, uh, either I fulfill it, and so I give you the results that you asked for, or I reject it, meaning that uh, there will be uh, there's been some errors and then I cannot give you the result. So this promise object has three states: still pending, fulfilled, and so I have the result, or rejected, and I have an error code. To create a promise, we create a, a new object with a constructor function promise. And uh, this function will, uh, the constructor of a promise takes a, a callback function as the only parameter. And this callback function has uh, two parameters that are both functions. Resolve function that I will call when I will fulfill the promise, and the reject function that I will call when some error happens. 
Uh, these are not functions that I define. Resolve and reject are not my functions, are functions that come from the promise library. My code is inside here. So what I'm doing here, I'm creating a promise object, and the body of this callback is uh, the asynchronous code that they want to execute, contains the asynchronous code that they want to execute. By itself, uh, the body of the promise need not doesn't need to be asynchronous. Um, this body is executed right away. This callback may be called immediately, may be started immediately. Then inside it, it may do something asynchronous. The important thing is that inside this code, we will always call either resolve or reject. Okay, inside our code, we are bound to execute one of these two, depending on what happens. In the future, when we have this information, it doesn't need to be right away. If we call resolve, then we are fulfilling the promise, and we are specifying which is the, the, the value that we want to return to my caller. If we call reject, we can pass a string uh, as an error message or an error object or whatever may be useful. The promise itself doesn't care about what type of object we are returning in, in, in both cases. It only cares that we are returning something in the good or the bad, uh, or the bad way. As I mentioned, we don't need to implement any of these two functions. They're already there. Okay, we don't. We don't see the code of this resolve and reject. These are just you know, the protocol that we use for, for telling that the promise is over. Even these names, resolve and reject, are totally arbitrary because you know, they are just the name of the parameter of a function here. We know that the first parameter to, the, to a promise callback is a function that, if we call this function, it will fulfill the promise. So if you want, you can call it fulfill or whatever. But Usually, we use this name, resolve reject. So we have an object here, promise, that we may use in the next lines of the code. This object uh, starts, and in the next line of the code here, we will start in the pending state. So we don't, we don't know, we don't have the value yet. How can we extract the value from the promise? Um, Here, uh, the uh, promise object has two methods. So the promise object uh, that is returned synchronously has two methods. One is called then, and the other is called catch. Each of these two uh, methods will return again the promise, so we can change the method. The then method provides a callback that will be called when the promise is fulfilled. And the argument of this callback is the value that will return there. So basically, when we call the resolve to a value, when we call resolve, actually, what we are doing is to call the callback of the function attached to the then method of the promise itself. It's not different from what we did here, OK? We have a callback function that is called when the operation is done. Only here we are doing that in a standardized way. Every asynchronous function may use the same mechanism, resolve, reject, then and catch. The then callback is called when the promise is fulfilled. The catch callback is called when the promise is rejected. And will contain the error object that we provided with the, to the call, the reject function. OK? So whenever we are creating a function that does something asynchronously, we will let the function return a promise. We don't need to invent our own callback mechanism. 
So if we want to transform into promises our code, we have this function course name. And this function will return a new promise. We see that for the first instruction we are returning. This function returns immediately. Doesn't do any work synchronously. This promise contains one parameter, which is a callback, a resolve, reject, and a value. The body of the promise callback is the actual code that we want to execute. So we are not executing the code in the context of the, of the function that we are defining here in line 15. We are executing our code inside the callback of the promise that is called immediately in a practical synchronous way. And we can execute our SQLite code. Why not? So we can take this code and move it here. And this code, of course, contains a callback because it's an asynchronous operation. This code may be synchronous or may contain a synchronous operation. This asynchronous operation may have callbacks on their own or may contain promises on their own. For the moment, we only have. And so what happens is that if I have an error, Instead of throwing an exception that I don't know how it's handled, I will reject the promise with the other objects. And otherwise, if I have the result, I will resolve the project, the, the promise, with the value of, this, of the result that we wanted to give. Uh, there's something. Okay, I'm. I don't remember. Okay. Okay. So it's easy to get lost here in the callbacks and braces and so on. Okay, so what we are not doing anything significantly different from what we did before. We are doing only doing that in the context of a promise object. Okay, so let's see what we wrote. I have. So I don't have, they don't need any. Here. I have a function that will return a promise that will resolve to a list of names. This is how we say it. This function returns a promise, and this promise will eventually resolve, if we don't have any errors, to the list of names from the database. We see that we are resolve is inside a callback. And if I can call resolve here as a closure. Okay, inside this callback here, I'm using the variable resolve, which is from the outside function. I may also use here some parameters. So maybe if you only want to call the name of the course with a given number, I don't know, of credits or whatever. I can use it here in building the, 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 the query, in building the, in using the, in filtering the results or whatever. All thanks to the closure mechanism. I can access all the values of all my nest, uh, nesting functions, the functions around me. Okay? I don't know, we don't have any parameter, we don't need to have any parameters. So basically, this return new promise is some, somehow transparent. It only runs my code. And it provides my code the ability of doing some smart or asynchronous returns. I cannot do any return from this callback 
I can only have some resolve, which is one kind of returning asynchronously in the future, and a reject, which is another sort of returning asynchronously in the future, an error call. And so, it very, uh, of course, we must ensure that we either reject or resolve the promises, otherwise the promise will, will be in the an undefined or, uh, say, uh, unresolved state forever. This callback uh, is, uh, so this function is returned immediately. This code here, this callback, also returns immediately because you see, syntactically, it only contains uh, one instruction, db.all. And we already know that db.all returns immediately. So we are a function that returns a new object whose parameter is a function that returns immediately. So everything is completed immediately. And I have this result of the function that sooner or later will resolve, hopefully. So my code that uses this function returns the promise, uh, receives the promise, uh, names uh, promise. It's uh, from course names. I have this promise here. If I try to print this promise, I only will get an object promise that doesn't contain the value itself. If I want to get the value, I must wait for the completion of the promise through the then method. So the name promise dot then I want to print the results of the name. So the values console.log values. Only complaints about the case, probably. Yeah. Okay. So again, we are using the callback way, but instead of providing the callback to the function that is a special case and we don't know which parameters and so on. We have a clear way of uh, uh, querying the result of the asynchronous operation. We have this uh, promise object that we, we can store somewhere. We can we can do something else and then come and check to the promise later on. When we are ready to decide what to do, we just call the then method and decide what to do with this promise itself. And of course, the behavior is always the same. If there was some error, I will so maybe let's write it in a we have a catch error and then do something with the error. For example, even just print. By the way, if an exception occurs inside the promise callback, an exception due to our programming error, or because I throw an exception myself, it is converted automatically into a reject. So instead of calling reject inside the promise, I can also throw an exception. And this exception will be managed by the promise by calling catch here as a method. So I have also a good mechanism for handling exceptions in the asynchronous call. The promise will convert it into a callback function that I can decide where to catch. And these promises objects, uh, okay, are good for handling one single asynchronous operation. 
for example, the query. In this example here, we have this, uh, uh, you remember the timeout that we played with, with before. We can also wrap a timeout, uh, which is raw object, into with, a, with its own callback and so on. We can wrap it into a promise. So having a promise that will resol resolve itself after one second or whatever. And so you see that uh, uh, we are setting timeout uh, and the actions to do when the timeout is completed is calling the resolve method of the promise itself, for example. And so the, the timeout will be in the form of a promise object. And the good of having promises objects is that, uh, okay, these are the basic methods. We have a then, which is the most important method of the promise with the uh, callback to execute uh, on the completion of the operation, successful completion of the operation. Uh, you may have a second optional argument uh, with a rejection callback, or the rejection callback could be in a catch method. So you can just have uh, uh, one then with a good and bad case, or then and catch. The, we are just registering a callback on the promise. So even then and catch may not need to be in the same statement as, as we did before. We have then somewhere and a catch somewhere else. Hmm? Uh, they are just adding this uh, registration of asynchronous callbacks. There's also a final method that will be called uh, either when it's complete, uh, successful or not. So if you want to do some close ups and clean up and you want to uh, all will be executed, we can call the on final. And the nice part is that all of these methods return promises. And so we can change them one after the other. So syntactically, they're very easy to, um, to, uh, to, to write. OK, so this is the you know, short version of how promises work. We create a promise. If we, if we call a result with a value, this value will be available as the parameter of them. And if we call reject, the value of reject will be used, will be available as the parameter of, a, of the catch callback function. So in way of teleporting a value across time and space. Across space, because we are pushing a value from this context into another function which is somewhere else in the code. Across time, because uh, this value will be available somewhere, some, sometimes, in the, some, some how and some when in the future. Um, and uh, this leads us to a way of programming that is uh, lead, leads to, let's say, a chaining style. Uh, when remember when we discussed about uh, uh, having sequential operations with callbacks, we say that we have the second operation in the callback on the first and the third operation in the callback on the second. Okay, right now what we are saying is that the second operation will be in the then of the first promise, and the third operation will be in the then of the second promise. So what we are doing here is, for example, uh, this is some code for querying the, um, I think it was some code for querying GitHub. Huh? Get repository information. It's in some callback that will query the GitHub website that returns some information about the repository. It's an asynchronous function, of course. And this it will return a promise. Sooner or later, the promise will resolve. And at that point, we have uh, the information about the repository. And so from this repository, we want to get the issues, for example, an issue, the last issue for the repository. We, this get issue call may only be called when the repository object is available. That is why we are putting them in the then callback of the first promise. 
We can execute get issue only after we have this repo information. It's easy because this callback, this callback here is executed in the then of the get repository information. So it will be executed exactly at the moment when we have the repo information available. And so we call get issue. And get issue by itself is, a, is again a promise, returns a promise because it is another asynchronous operation. And so with this callback will resolve itself to a promise. This promise is returned immediately, and I'm chaining some code to be executed later when the second promise is fulfilled. So, and this in this case, we have the issue, which is the result of calling get issue. So you see that the result of, get, of calling get repo info is the parameter of the callback. We can use it in the body of the callback because it's available right now. And then we call a function get issue whose resulting value will be the parameter of the next callback. So the return value of get issue is here on the next line. And we use it, now it's available and we can use it for calling another asynchronous method. That will return, we call a get owner that will return a promise that will resolve with a value of the actual owner. So the return value of, of the get owner will be the value of the resolved promise and so on. So we are writing code that looks um, sequential. This and then and then and then. Of course, we don't put semicolons to go to from one operation to the to, the, to another. We write a then statement. Understand the method, and that will help us in chaining all those callbacks. And these callbacks will be executed in order. Of course, when we exit from the chain, we are outside these dependencies. Okay, so in the, again, if we are here, the line, if we write a line here, it will be executed before all of this. In order to maintain sequential dependencies, we must still be in the chain of promises, consumption of the promises. Okay. And by the way, the chaining is good because it may allow us only to do one catch for all of the promises. So this catch will be called if any of the previous promises fail. Because if the first one fails, we will not call then, we will not call then, we will not call then, we will call catch. Because the f uh, the, the, all these callbacks will not be executed. If a first will be executed, then we have a, a, a promise here from which normally it will call the then method, but if uh, there are some problems, it will look for a catch method to call. And so on. So it, okay, it takes a while no, to wrap our mind uh, around this method of working, but after that, it will really help us to avoid all the difficult code to write. Just remember, a promise is a value that will be available in the future. And so when I need to specify what to do with this feature, I will put it into a then statement. Um, of course, uh, the note here is that always remember uh, to, to return something to resolve the, the the promise otherwise the, the chain will be blocked so if, if any of them <laughs> uh, forgets to to return a value you see this get issue here by itself the get issue function returns a value a promise my callback also returns a promise Because you see the shortcut, uh, the shorthand notation for the arrow function, there are no braces here. So there's just an expression, and the value of this expression is the result of the callback. And so it can it will be the result of the whole then statement in the future. If we had to put some braces here, 
it will be wrong because we will then execute get issue. Get issue will return a promise, but this promise is not returned to the external context. So if you put the braces, remember to, uh, to return get issue. Okay, we are not creating any promise here in our code here. The promises are, are being created inside the function. But then we must not forget or, or about the promises that are being returned so that the chains uh, uh, can continue. And uh, so this is some kind of code that we are going to write a lot. Uh, there are also a couple of methods that if we have many promises objects, one way of handling them is a sequential, okay, like we saw, we have a chain of them. Uh, by the way, all these, infer all these operations will proceed while the rest of the program is doing something else, okay? So we know, we specify what we need to do in that chain of events, and then we can use the, the CPU for doing something else. We are not being blocked, it's not sequential code, that's a good part. Because nothing is blocking. Each of these call returns immediately. But they will be called in sequence when the uh, corresponding data is available. Uh, it may happen that we now need to start a lot of operations. Or we may have many promises to start. And so uh, there are two methods that help us to combine different uh, promises. Uh, for example, the all method takes, as an argument, an array of promises. So you need to execute 20 queries that are independent from each other, for example, or get different information. I don't know which completes first or which completes last, but I need to, to wait until all of them are completed. So I can create a composite promise with the promise.all method that receives a list of promises and will resolve only when all of the result of the individual uh, promises have been resolved. So internally, it, it does all the then and all the catches for all the individual uh, promises and then will count uh, when all of them have been resolved, uh, then it will call the then, or we'll call a catch if at least one of them fails. So it's a way of launching many parallel operations and then having a synchronization point at the end, say, okay, now all of the all of the operations are completed. Uh, I'd want to do something with the results. And the opposite is the race that starts many promises and returns uh, when the first one completes. So I just need the result for a first uh, for any of these operations to complete. So I, I, I run them in parallel. Uh, if I am doing some, you know, some application with redundancy, I can get information from different sources. The first one I get uh, is enough because they may, maybe they are replicated sources. And I'm not sure how fast they are or whether even whether they are available. So instead of polling the first one and maybe it goes into timeout, then I pull the second one, I pull all, all of them in parallel. Of course, I sort of overload in my external resources, but uh, uh, as soon as I have an, a, a, a result, I will, can go forward. So basically, there are two simple mechanisms. Not that we are not using them very often because it's not so common to have an array of promises to wait. But just to show you that uh, since we have these simple objects, promises, they can be combined in different ways. So we can have higher level functions for combining them and for letting us, let me say, manage the workflow of a synchronous operation. Okay, so I, I think it's, uh, we had enough <laughs> for the first hour. Uh, we can stop here. Uh, in the second hour, I will try my way to digest a bit better with some uh, a couple of exercises. And then we move on to another syntax that make is, makes it even easier to use uh, uh, promises than the current uh, uh, version with the change of dance. Okay, so let's do 15 minutes or so of break. Hmm? Okay.